about is actually last year at the Lean Coaching Summit, um, Dr. Will Hewen and uh, Ray Manitin actually gave a keynote presentation. And it was such a great um, story and message that they gave, I immediately knew that I wanted to have them come and uh, um, share their story here at Leadership Week. Um, they have an amazing story, amazing and inspiring sh story to share. Um, but first, let me, let me tell you a little bit about them, just to give you a little frame up of who they are. Um, Dr. Will Hewen is Associate Clinical Professor at the me at, of Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco and serves at the Zuckerberg San Francisco um, General Hospital as an Associate Chief Medical Officer and also the Medical Director of Quality Management and also in the Kaizen Promotion Office. Um, he will be joined by Ray Manitin, who is a General Services Manager of the Environmental Services Department, also at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. He is the co-owner of the development and uh, implementation of the Discharge Room Turnaround Workflow Efficiency Project, which was led by the Kaizen Promotion Office at the Zuckerberg Hospital. So with that, please join me in welcoming Will and Ray to share their inspiring story with us this morning. Good morning. What an honor and a privilege. Um, we actually wanted to first start by thanking the entire Lean Frontiers team. It's been a great experience. We've learned a lot as well as our Hyatt Regency team and Lance for our AV support today. Can give them a big round of applause. <laughs> we also want to thank you all for being here. You're probably wondering why a doctor and a housekeeper are here um, to tell you a story. And We've had the opportunity to reflect on our story. It started as a story of how a doctor and a housekeeper first met and learned some really big lessons in healthcare improvement. And for us, it's actually been an act of self-discipline and reflection because we've come back to the story. We've each grown. We've each faced new challenges. We keep learning, and the lessons still stand true for us. Um, we've updated the story. You're going to hear more about how we're facing a new challenge, and we hope that it provides some service to you as well today. Again, my name is Will Hewen. I think you've heard enough about who I am. I serve as the Associate Chief Medical Officer at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. My name is Raylan Manitan. I am the General Services Manager for Environmental Services at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. So we, we're really, we feel really fortunate to work at a place uh, in San Francisco called Zuckerberg San Francisco General. As a bigger context, we just want to offer two points. One is we're a really complex organization. So we have a new name, it's a fancy name, but we've been San Francisco's only public hospital for more than 150 years. We're the only level one trauma center, we're the only psychiatric emergency services, 40% of ambulance traffic comes through our hospital. We're on standby when dignitaries, like today, I just got an activation, we're on standby when dignitaries visit from out of town. We're on standby if a man is found and, found and unconscious in an encampment on 6th and Mission. We are also part of the University of California, San Francisco. Our affiliation agreement actually goes back to before those buildings were built, more than 125 years, where we are one of three sites in the University of California, San Francisco's training program. And then at the bottom, the logos here, is we are part of the San Francisco Health Network and part of the San Francisco Department of Public Health, which means that we report up through the, the city hall that we are part of jail health services 20 primary care clinics, 24 mental health clinics, maternal child services, and population health. The second thing we want to make sure you know is that we've been on a lean journey, and we are definitely still learning for about 10 years now. And at the 30,000-foot view, the less messy version of the story is that we've had three phases in our evolution. As many of you have actually heard a similar description, we have this rapid adoption of lean tools and improvement by event. Nodding, yes, we all have that experience <laughs> as well. Then we realized we needed a way to pull it all together and make sure improvement happens on an everyday basis. So our second phase has been around strategic deployment and development and continuing to learn how to do daily management system well. And then the third phase is around principle-based leadership. We've really focused now on our leaders and thinking about how do we want our leaders to be behaving on an everyday basis. And so we're practicing, we're learning as an expanded executive team how to really practice our principles. But the story we want to offer is actually the perspective through our eyes. So first, we're going to give you our story, one story, amongst many. 
about how we learn from a crisis. Second, we would like to practice inquiry and thinking with you. And then finally, we'll come back to see how some of those lessons are helping us with a new challenge. So welcome. Some of you have probably, unfortunately, had the opportunity to be admitted to a hospital. Probably some of you have gone to an emergency department. Um, I hope some of you have at least visited your own primary care providers in their offices. And the question we want to ask you is, what do you know about how well those patient areas were cleaned? So welcome to our hospital. You're probably going to stay in this room for about three to seven days. We're always full and always busy, so about 90 minutes before you got here, another person just finished their hospitalization for the last three to seven days. I want you to consider the inevitability of bodily fluids, infectious diseases, all of those touch points, all of those surfaces in your room. I realize that I've been taking care of patients in these rooms for more than 15 years. I've trained medical providers. I actually run quality improvement projects to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. And I had no idea how well the rooms were being cleaned. What do you know about the staff who clean these rooms? Their names, their backgrounds, the training that they've all gone through. And we ask you the question, are our staff learn to ask themselves, would you let your mother stay in this room? Despite my 11 years on the front line and as a supervisor, I also really didn't realize how, our, how much our system was broken or how many way, different ways the rooms were being cleaned. So the background, like I named the background stories, starts with clean hospital rooms are just foundational. We all know about 5S, but these are foundational for patient experience, for flow, for safety. And we opened a brand new hospital, and it took us five to six months, five to six months to realize that rooms weren't being cleaned as we expected, and we had some major defects in the cleaning. Up to one in four rooms had major problems in the way they were being cleaned. So what we want to offer is how we first reacted, because we laugh about this a lot. How do you react when you sense that there's a problem in your organization? For myself, as an executive, as a physician, I was shocked. I was dismayed. But then the quality improvement hat turned on, you know, that one that loves gaps, and like, I can't believe it. This is gonna be a huge opportunity, right? Because we had been working with largely our clinical staff, and, and at that time, really focusing on lean tools, but we hadn't really worked with our housekeeping staff. This is an opportunity to spread our tools, to improve experience, improve safety, and improve flow. How'd that go for you guys? My first reaction as a EVS supervisor, oh my God, I can't believe it. My staff was going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I didn't know what lean was. Uh, but the reaction of my staff initially was, of course, you know, those normal reactions. Who are these people coming in to our department to tell us how to clean? How could I let this happen? And on several occasions, where were my balls? Really, where were my balls? <laughs> what we learned is it would take patience and discipline before we all could feel safe and see the problem right in front of us. So the current state and analysis. What I'm actually really proud of is our organization didn't react as we normally would. We're in a highly regulated, one of the most highly regulated industries out there. And normally we react with firefighting. We tell people to work harder, we tell them what to do, we tell them how to solve their problems. In fact, when our regulators come, Center for Medicare Services, known as CMS, they do just that. They CMS, and then we tell housekeeping to clean it up. That's how we react every single time. But as an organization, we've been learning, we've been practicing, we've gone to trainings in A3 thinking, we practiced our humble inquiry, we go to the Gemba, and that's just what we did. So we've used more than 70 observations and process maps, we practiced our A3 thinking, we found that, sure enough, room turnover was taking two to three times longer than we expected, and 23% of the rooms had cleaning defects. Now, for those of you who have attended trainings in humble inquiry and asking effective questions and going to Gemba, that's easier said than done, right? Because to be honest, despite all of my practice and training, my first efforts were a total disaster. 
let me explain. I would walk, you know, oftentimes during a moment in my morning, maybe I had no meeting zones, maybe I didn't, um, but I would go into the Gemba and I'd find a housekeeper. And I'd probably be interrupting them or right after they just got done with a two hour clean. And I'm like, hi, my name is Will Hewen. I'm the Associate Chief Medical Officer. I would love to just observe, if you don't mind. Love to ask you some questions if you have the chance, talk to you more about how things are going, what's going well, what are your barriers? This is how we're all trained, right? How well did that work? <laughs> now, it, it's great, it's good, and they were pushing the housekeeping cart, running away from me down the hall as fast as you've ever seen. <laughs> and it wasn't until the second time and then the third time that that happened to me, the exact same thing, that it dawned on me. Who was I to expect a trusting relationship with my housekeeping staff? Who was I to expect truth when asking questions? For 15 years, I have been working around, we've been working around each other. We literally, if I walk in the room, they leave. If they walk in the room, I leave. And you think about the years of hierarchy, decades of hierarchy between us. The white coat, the badge, the degrees, the title, all separating us. Let's go further though. The language I speak at home, frankly, is often a different language. I actually speak Spanish and English at home, but different language than what many of my staff speak. Our education, our backgrounds, our cultural identities are totally different. It's pushing us away. So I realized I had a lot to learn. This is why you only give me one button to do. <laughs> Initially, I told my staff, don't worry. They just want to engage. Then that's when they saw the stopwatches and the exec team was just encircling them and all the focus was on us. I told them, don't be scared. You're the professional here. They should be scared of you. Early on, I watched my staff get asked questions about how things were going and what could be improved. And they didn't answer. And they, or they would just look at me to answer the question for them. And it just dawned on me at that moment. I never had really asked my staff about their problems or how they can improve. It took patience and practice, but once we got together, shared the data, and shared our stories, that's when our team really began to, began to engage. The reactions were, this can't be correct. This just can't be. Focused on our patients, our mantra would now become, would you let your mother or loved one stay in this room? So we use the problem tree to ask why room turnover was too long with too many defects. To understand why we mapped the process and we realized that 111 minutes of, were wasted on poor communication alone. Why? For each room, staff completed multiple, tasks, uh, multiple steps, including six calls or pages, three paper log entries, uh, four entries into computer systems that didn't speak to each other. Why this ridiculous system? For years, everyone had their own practices, there were tons of errors and rework and workarounds, and of course, more steps just had to be better, right? <laughs> when it came to the defects, we found that 23% of our rooms had these huge cleaning defects, and we asked the reason why, and we said, turned out the old standards were applied in the new hospital, and they weren't working. We only gave 45 minutes to clean a room. We asked why again, and all of our staff knew the answer. All of the rooms were bigger, 20% bigger. They're beautiful. They all have their own bathrooms. They all have their own showers. How long does it take you guys to clean a shower? Right? They had 20 new touch points at least. There were things like workstations and keyboards and touch screens that no one had been assigned to clean for five months. So Ray and I have really thought a lot about why it could be that such major problems could exist in an organization that were so obvious for so long. And you had to go further. And this was evidence that there was something deeper. And for ourselves, we decided that there were these deep cultural barriers to frontline voice and safety. Our staff was afraid. 
So like any complex problem, we launched multiple countermeasures. We'll summarize two for you. One is development of standard work, and the second is the culture of teaching and PDSA and using data within the housekeeping team. These tools were priceless. But the real goal was trying to create an environment of respect and trust. We want to show you how we try to go and do that. The first thing, the first thing we did was create our own standard work. I really appreciated how Will modeled the creation and coaching of the standard work as a tool, but also as a way to empower my team. After some initial teaching, he kept saying, hey, 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 I'm your secretary. I'll just type what you tell me to. This is your document. And it took a while. Our staff had never really been asked what can be improved. But with some time, I saw this, my staff make the connection and filled with pride. They used this document to explore and share the best practices they never ever shared, even with each other. Standard work wasn't telling somebody what to do. It became our current best way, owned by us, the frontline staff. Our team ended up making more than 15 new drafts. It actually justified adding 20, 25 additional minutes to our cleaning times. The standard work always ended with one last question. Would you let your mother stay in this room? To this day, it still has that last step. Yep. This is now a depiction. This is a, a depiction of how we aspired our organization to have a culture of teaching PDSA and data. And it's inspired by Ray and his team. I have to tell you, so I'm a clinical professor, pretty good teaching organization. And I learned so much in watching Ray and how to teach and how to coach. Let me tell you what I mean. I watched Ray ask his team, how can we improve? And then he paused and he waited often uncomfortably and waited and pivoted often to try to make sure his staff felt more comfortable until he got real answers. It takes a lot of discipline. I have watched Ray help his team draft standard work, but then also to do the standard work himself and to test it. These are 75 minute cleans. And so Ray, about 20 minutes in, is sweating. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's taking his jacket off, his team is laughing, they're all having a great time. And at the end, they realize they didn't hit their mark, we missed a bunch of steps, and you did it all over again. Talk about leadership. I also watched Ray teach my own Kaizen Promotion Office team how to develop standard work for teaching standard work. And the th reality is, for him, it came instinctively. He said, one, your staff have to feel comfortable. They have to have a moment in their day where they can take this on. And we have to explain why we're making the change in the first place. It's obvious, but most of us skip that step. The second is he had to explain it, teach it, and then third, he had to model it. He said they had, I would bring him into a room, I watched this many times, bring him into a room, they, he handed them the standard work and he would show them step by step by step. And oftentimes, because they reported to him, they try to help. He's like, no, 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 no. I want you to watch, this is important. Let me know if I miss anything. And then, he'd come back, and once they were ready, they'd do it themselves, and then his team would learn to teach and coach one another to continue the process. With time, we've been developing our people, but we were really developing ourselves. Thank you. Our results. Ultimately, we added 20 minutes to the time allowed for staff to clean these rooms but we reduced overall time by 48%, uh, cutting down on wasteful, poor communication. This potentially reduced patient waits by 90 hours per day. We, re we are really proud that we sustained zero cleaning defects, but one more thing, now our housekeeping staff was really seeing the problems, they have a voice, uses the data and just keep getting better. Until we didn't. One year later, our turnaround times rose again. The conditions definitely changed, but I also fell back on my firefighting ways. 
I just wanted the bleeding to stop. I made quick assumptions and even found data to confirm these false assumptions <laughs> and was ready to blame my staff for slipping. Then I met with Will. He put aside the data that I had in my hand and asked me what my real challenge was. And how did I know? I showed him again. I said, it's right here. And then he just put it aside again. How do you really know? And it dawned on me. I had silenced my staff's voice again. Soon I remembered I needed to go and see. I met with individual staff and asked their opinions about their delays, even when it meant I had to help clean the rooms with them so that they can have the time to communicate. Then I put their answers into a Pareto chart to better understand what the processes and conditions uh, had caused these problems. And now we were getting back on track. Follow-up is really hard, right? And creating safety, but then sustaining safety for your staff and your leaders is even harder, I'd say. Um, so I remember when Ray and his team came to our committee and presented their data, and their heads were hanging low, and they were ashamed, right? Because you get that big win, and then it goes away, and then people either choose to not ever talk about it again, or talk about it. So I remember a time in our organization when people didn't want to tell those ugly truths. And I think many of you know that feeling. We still have those moments, but we've been practicing, we've been learning to support people to tell those ugly stories with A3 thinking, and the leader's role is to use humble inquiry, diagnostic inquiry, to support the rest of our organization to problem solve. Not just tell them what to do, and then come back next month, and tell you some more things to do, and then come back next month, because that's how we used to react whenever we saw red. So I'm really proud of how much we're learning. Our leaders were beaming in response to Ray. They brought their own hand-collected data. It was updated for that month, not six months ago. They were already hypothesizing on why things were going wrong, and they already had tests and ideas of what to, what to do next. A couple of the things we wanted to offer you all is that we've learned that we, we're not just doing these in the moments and the events, but we're also trying to practice our skills on a daily basis. One day I was coming into work, it was after hours, and I saw Ray and his team, they're cleaning, and I just assumed they were doing their work. What I realized was Ray was actually teaching students from the City College of San Francisco on house and environmental services in healthcare. So while he had been incorporating teaching and coaching in his daily job, he was bringing those same skills into the community. And that's how you get excellence. So Will thought he was just joking about inviting housekeeping to inpatient rounds. I took him up on that offer. On that day, he was busy. Lots of patients, students, residents. What surprised me most is Will is at the top of his hierarchy, but there is a layering of coaching from the ground up, even with his patients. Everyone practices asking open-ended questions, waiting for and listening to the thinking, and sometimes re-asking the question that made it safe to speak and created shared ownership of the problem solving, not only with the trainees, but with the patients. Even as a doctor, he is a coach in his daily work, and he's training future physicians to be coaches. Those four pages of notes are some of the best feedback I've ever gotten on rounds. Um, so we want to leave you with three key learnings, and we actually want to practice with you a little bit. So we'll leave you with these three key learnings to consider. Number one, safety, not fear, for all staff at all levels. We expose long-standing cultural and hierarchical barriers that are still there to this day. Team leaders, like Ray, are key to creating the trust, safety, and willingness to speak up. Two, problem solving. We rallied staff to uh, problem solve with data, tools, system, and mission. Would you let your mother stay in this room? And finally, leadership at all levels all levels. We're developing our staff as problem solvers, but then we have to develop ourselves as coaches. So we are, this is our story, but we want to see how that sits with you all. And so with some help, we're going to pivot. Anybody used Slido before? No. 
This is your moment. You get to open your phones, <laughs> your devices, your computers, and type in slido.com in your browser. S-L-I-D-O.com. And in the password, put Lean Frontiers. I hope you can connect to Wi-Fi. People get in there? So we want to practice inquiry with you. This is our own skill development. Um, and before we ask you the hard questions, we know that you don't know us. We don't know you. We don't know your feelings about doctors. You probably have some implicit bias about, about how all-knowing I need to be. You also may not know how you feel about housekeeping. So this is our first question. When I see my own healthcare provider, my emotional reaction is A, woohoo, I love my doctor. I love my provider. B, I like my provider OK, and I know I have to go for my own good. C, I hate the waiting. They need more flow. Or D, doctors, I'm a great problem solver. Can't I just Google my own symptoms? <laughs> Not as bad as I thought. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this morning was. We'll give you a few more seconds here. <laughs> All right, I feel better. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. All right. Thank you, Lance. Uh, two. How clean is your bathroom right now? <laughs> a. I love 5S, a place for everything and everything in its place. B, it's pretty clean when I get the time to clean it. <laughs> C, I hope my guests don't look too closely. Or D, just close the door and don't go in there. <laughs> they answered this one a lot faster. You know? <laughs> and many more people have weighed in. I'm saving these responses, by the way. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to go to our three real questions. And these are questions that we ask in our organization. So I want you to consider many of you um, in your organizations, okay, or organizations you've worked for most recently. In my organization, everyone feels safe and empowered to speak up about problems. Forty, I do my math. Forty-seven percent disagree or strongly disagree. Only about thirty-three percent of you all agreed with the idea that your staff can speak up. Mm. We've got work to do. All right, let's go to the next question. In my organization, when we have a problem, my organization is focused on problem solving, not reacting and telling, not fear or blaming, not just work harder. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe bimodal here. Yeah. Interesting. So about 40, mid 40s agree with that, and the mid 40s disagree. 38% no, disagree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some of you are still trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to question three. This is always an interesting one for us. Leaders at all levels. Now, I think we've tried to stretch a perspective of what all levels are today. Leaders at all levels of my organization, top and bottom, are committed to continuous improvement and learning, especially for themselves. We heard a little about executive commitment yesterday. Great. The majority of you disagree or strongly disagree. The opportunity for next year's thinking about our agenda for next year. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So we wanted you to think about your organizations. We want to make you feel a little uncomfortable, is our intention. Open some perspectives. So now we want to challenge you. We want to 
kind of after you've done some reflection and thinking, what are some ideas you have? So I wanted to ask you to turn to one person in the audience, just one. Think for about 20 seconds for you introverts in there. I'll give you 20 seconds to be introverted. But um, we'll ask you, what is one thing you could do better to better understand or improve your supportive staff at all levels with safety, not fear for all staff, problem solving, or leadership at all levels? It could be something you've seen from us, but I bet you guys all have ideas and you can share. So I'll give you about 20 seconds, and then I'll invite you to share for about two minutes, not long, okay? See how long many of you introverts can hold out. <laughs> Extroverts can handle that. That was less than six seconds. <laughs> all right, go ahead and share. <laughs> I like the Slido. Huh? The Slido. Yeah. I like that. If you haven't switched, please switch. <laughs> Hopefully we can get them back on. Uh, hmm? Hopefully we can get them top back. <laughs> 20 seconds. Okay, all right. Oh man, thank you all for the energy. <laughs> thank you all for that energy. Again, well, our, hope, our hope was that our story could provide some service to you all, at least an opportunity to do a little reflection and get some ideas, get your juices stirring. Um, so we're gonna move on to the third part <coughs> and how Ray and I have taken on a new challenge. And um, we're interested to see how this sits with you all. Because the question we have, now that you've thought a lot about your organization, your culture, how you react to problems, and how you might apply them in supporting what are, frankly, some prin major principles in lean leadership, safety, problem solving, and leadership at all levels. Because Ray and I have found that those same lessons continue to help us. Because the question I have for you is what happens if the problem your organization is facing is racism? or challenges in equity. How many of you chose, had that in mind when you were thinking about this exercise? At least one, thank you, two. So I want, I want to make sure that we challenge you to really consider this issue. For us as an organization, we have decided that in our work, we see this every day that equity issues and challenge issues of race, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, gender identity. We know this from the national data. We know this from my everyday work. It's affecting our patients' health. 
It's affecting and creating disparities in the care we provide and frankly, the outcomes that we achieve. We also know that racism and iniquity impacts how our staff experience their jobs, their lives, and how they, tr how they treat each other. So again, think about this. We've adopted equity as a true north value for ourselves. If you haven't been able to address issues of implicit bias, of assumption about people, jumping to assumptions, if you haven't thought about people's identity, if you haven't grappled with issues like white privilege, how do you ever achieve respect for everyone? How do you ever achieve safety for staff, safety for patients? How do you achieve quality if you don't address issues like equity? That's something that we're taking on as an organization and it feels enormous. So what we want to do is offer you how we've each tried to handle this just a little bit. We are not experts in this, but we're learning a lot. We have taken this on as a strategic value, but also as, a, um, as an actual strategy throughout the organization. One area where Will has been leading this work is in supporting all departments to examine their improvement for disparities in race and ethnicity, or ethnicity. I was really uncomfortable talking about race. Something I didn't want to touch. I even reverted back to my frontline instincts. And in a meeting, I told, I said, I'm in housekeeping. Equity isn't a problem for us. And word for word. Yeah. Said that. Then I heard Will's voice. <laughs> Interesting. Tell me more. The conversation had begun. And throughout the conversation, I really appreciated how Will put me at ease and to feel safe and to talk about race and equity. This was his standard work in coaching. He helped coach us to think hard about the data and uh, that we could look at, including thinking about how patients rated room cleanliness by race, based on race. He gave us lots of examples on, of how other departments were challenging their similar assumptions, such as neurology in their stroke care, or food and nutrition in patient satisfaction surveys with their meals. I was inspired and encouraged how there was leadership at all levels, and this helped my department take ownership even for problems as big as equity and racism. I'm proud to say we're on track that we're at 100% of all of our departments have stratified their data in the last year yeah. looking at this. And the biggest, part, biggest win isn't the data, it's the questioning of assumptions. I'll challenge someone and six months later they'll come up with at least seven, eight, nine ways that maybe race, ethnicity, language, and assumptions are creating disparities in their work. In ways that we would never have thought about the ownership is left with each department. So it's one thing though to think about how we're affecting others in, in our patients. And I think the national data has pretty much made this a consensus issue for all of us. It's a little stickier and I'm curious because we're in a room full of HR people how you think about race when you're treating one another. So one of the things that Ray did recently was he created a daily management system, right? Because this is supposed to let everyone speak freely. And you, you create a, put a huddle board on, and you get these improvement cards out there and everybody can post these improvement opportunities and they can speak without fear. Not so much, right? So about four months into this, Ray received an anonymous improvement opportunity simply described that the problem was racism. And the potential solution was very simple. Let's just treat everyone the same. Now, I want to quibble about what equity really means, but this was a major improvement opportunity for them. What do you think they did with that improvement opportunity? It sat on the board for about two months. They didn't know what to do. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. I had the privilege of watching his team take this on, and I want to describe a couple of reflections I had and just sitting there and observing. We didn't tell them anything. 
Okay, we didn't give them a lot of support, frankly, to do this, but a lot of our original lessons resonated. The first set of discussions were, well, why was this person anonymous in the first place? What could we do as leaders to make people feel safe to speak up when they see something without being fearful, without having to put this in an anonymous, um, without calling HR as an anonymous concern? So they were focused on safety for all of their staff, not fear. Problem solving, and this was fascinating. The team said, we have to understand why. We can't just react, because a lot of people were originally like, let's call these people, let's call these people, here's what we have to do. But then like, well, no, we actually have to figure out why. This housekeeping supervisor sitting there saying, perhaps we can look at the data. We can look at the data and look and see if, if the way we've assigned work shifts is different, right? Overtime usage, maybe how we write people up. They even said, let's design our own survey. Our organization actually launched a survey two years ago, and frankly, we haven't touched it. 109 questions. <laughs> now, that's probably part of the reason why. Yeah. This, these guys said, let's look at the, that survey again. Maybe there's some essential questions we can ask and do more of a pulse survey on our own. Fascinating. So they were problem solving this in a way that I hadn't seen in any other department yet. And then the final piece, which is fascinating, was that Ray's boss stepped up and said, and everybody in the room nodded in approval. Maybe each of us actually need to think about ourselves first. We need to have a mindset to consider what are our assumptions. And we can share that with the rest of our department. And what are the behaviors that I'm doing that may be creating a lack of respect, a sense that I have favoritism for certain people based on race or ethnicity or language. So a lot of work to do on this topic. I think there's a lot of work for all of us to do on this topic. But I am really thrilled to continue learning with this department. So we're going to leave you with these three learnings, because they're continuous. Number one, again, safety, not fear for all staff. Two, problem solving as a habit. Three, leadership at all levels, individuals, the group, the entire organization. We thank you all for your time, especially thank our home teams for letting us have the privilege of being here and representing them. A special thanks to Ray for presenting with me. Thank you. We have time for questions. Oh, oh dear. Goodness. We left too much time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got a point. Was that part of the standard work? Or? <laughs> oh, we do have time for questions. And uh, first of all, let me just thank you uh, both for sharing your story. Incredibly powerful and a great example for all of us, whether we're in accounting, whether we're in human resources. And it's frankly, it's one of the things that I've loved about Lean uh, and the Lean community is uh, how it betters not only myself, but betters our team, our organization, our communities, and, and our world. I, you know, Lean, Lean Frontiers, I speak for all of us. We don't do this because we like running conferences. We do this because we really truly believe that we're having an impact in the world. So thank you for that very practical personal example. So we have a few uh, time for questions. Raise your hand. We have a couple of microphones around. There's maybe one back here. Guys, great job. That was good. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, just a comment and a couple questions. Uh, well, you know, as, you, as a leader, you basically, you know, humbled yourself and you lowered yourself, which to me, and by the way, I don't lower yourself the way I did yesterday, okay? Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. but uh, uh, and I'm glad we have a bunch of medical guys in the room. Uh, but uh, that to me is like, 50% of the challenge right there because I, I could tell by talking to, I just happened the other day, CEO of a $3 billion industrial, and just by talking to him, I know he is not going to be successful, okay? And so what you did is a bigger deal probably than you even think, okay, number one. So congratulations. And uh, it's rare, by the way, it's rare. Um, more of a te technical question, as you guys go through, you created standard work, you kind of sat back and look at some of the data over the time, and you guys said, hey, we're kind of getting out of sync here and all that. The challenge I think you got here, to me anyway, and I can't figure out how to do it, is 
one of the things you really want to make sure of is, you know, you could measure activities, right? I, I clean the bed, I clean this, I clean that. But how do you really measure whether or not there's still infectious, uh, you know, material left in the room because it's invisible, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I'm even curious, like, as to how you guys came up with a 23% defect rate to begin with, okay? And how did you do that? So the real challenge would be, how do I do on a daily basis monitor my standard work so that I can tell daily whether or not I'm off or not, you know, and what's that feedback mechanism as you, as you, as you move through? And then one other question is the equity and racism uh, work that you guys are doing. <clears throat> I guess I, if I go back to you know, lean thinking, the first question I have before I start looking at all the issues is what problem are we trying to solve? Okay, and that's, I, I missed that in your presentation. I, I, I'm not sure there was a clearly defined problem. And even that note that you showed that said racism was the root cause with no problem statement. So I'm trying to understand, you know, what problem are you guys trying to solve? And I think maybe equity and racism might be a Venn diagram, um, or they may be separate too, right? So I'm just trying to apply lean thinking to what you're doing and, and understanding what, what really is the problem we're trying to solve there. So anyway, those are a couple of questions I have for you. So how do you, how do you monitor yourself on an ongoing basis? Are you guys still working on trying to figure that out, which is fine? And then the other question about what problem we're trying to solve. That's, that's kind of my thinking line. Okay. See your presentation, so. Take one shot and I'll give it to yeah. you. He's, he's the expert here on the, on the cleaning end. Um, trying to answer both questions with one answer. This is really hard. I think on the one hand, I think that you'll, you'll hear this in a second, this concept of um, you know it when you see it, do I have to measure it? And there's certain unmeasured things that I've learned, the concept of blink, right? We can develop, we can see, he can see a problem in ways that I can't. Just like when I see a sick patient, I know if a patient's sick, and sometimes those cues are, are um, not obvious to me, but I know it. And I think that's true for racism too, and I'm just, just to put that out there, because I have not yet seen a good survey, a climate survey. Um, I know I have measurable data, but frankly those are rarely good enough to validate many of the assumptions I know. So I think you're right, it's a big challenge. We have to pick something and start somewhere. I will offer, there's one other, we actually measure ATP. So this is, um, this is a bio, biological measurement. There's actually these tools that we can go and swab a bunch of spots. And he does this. He goes around and you can measure basically biological living matter. And you want lower amounts. And we can actually validate some of his content expertise with machinery. To be honest, his, his eyeball test is better when we looked at it. Because we would touch screens and do all these things and then test it. He could tell there's smudges and the machine was failing. So just to offer that, but I'll let him say more. Uh, what I was about to say, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah uh, we have a, we have a uh, machine measuring uh, organic matter on, on surfaces. Also, we took into account um, deficiencies such as smearing, you know, like once you enter a room, you can. I mean, you know, like uh, you can see, breathe in, uh, you know, defects such as those. We'll pull in our, our porter just to say, like, would you really, like, honestly, stand in the middle of this room, would you let your mom stay in this room? And, you know, all of a sudden they just, got it, I hit this part, I'll hit this part. And then, you know, further testing, we start bringing down levels uh, biomatter levels to, to an acceptable level and where we're very proud to um, hang our hat on. Um, on. In terms of the, the second question to trying to focus uh, the big issue is um, we, you know, like because we're a civil service department, overtime is voluntary, it's not mandatory. Uh, you know, may, may we were trying to look into is there a certain individual, you know, group getting more overtime than another group? Um, maybe you want to standardize something there. Um, uh, time off requests, standardize something there. Um, you know, it, we're, we're looking into bridging all the gambit. We had just uh, come up with a 25 question survey 
that is currently out in circulation with our department right now, and which was uh, derived from the, taken from the 109 question survey that's more appropriate for our department. And um, I'm- And hopefully in multiple languages. Yes. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, we should have some, some promising results of where to start looking at, you know? Yeah, and, and just, to, just to close it, I, I think we're still learning. And you can't improve it, you can't measure it, but we haven't been measuring it, we haven't even been talking about it. So that's what's been fascinating, right? I go to my departments and I ask them, I was like, what do you think we could measure? And they come up with measures we've never considered. I can't do this top down. Um, and th and that's, that's just the truth of it. We're, we're, we have to learn from people kind of being more reflective and thinking about their own care. Based on this presentation, Ray, it sounds like you have grown a lot as a leader and you've been enabled to do that by will in, in many regards. And that's so congratulations to you for the willingness to do that, because not everybody's willing. Uh, well, my question to you is how, um, it, let's just say medical school isn't highly respected for teaching people to listen and respect the opinions of others, et cetera. It so is or it isn't. Excuse it me. is not generally known for that. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, that's what I thought of you said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how did you become who you are from a leader standpoint? Did you get training? Were you born this way like Lady Gaga? Or how did you <laughs> develop those leadership skills that enables you to help others? Um, I, 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 so usually I'd like to ask you a bunch of questions, um, but I won't. So I, I will say that um, I don't think physicians are really that different than other experts. We're just spend a little more time in school, we develop a little more expertise, and uh, the way our profession works is we get more and more specialized in masses of specific knowledge. That's a challenge. So, uh, but I think that um, we don't teach many people how to listen. I mean, I, and we joke about this, but a clerk who doesn't listen can bring your improvement project to its <laughs> knees just yeah, as easily true. as a physician. Maybe not just as easily, but just pretty effectively. Um, so I, just to put that out there, I, I, that's my approach. I will say that um, I came into healthcare. I'm a, a, a son of a family of activists from the East Bay, the Bay Area. I thought I was gonna change the world just by the pure strength of energy and ideas. And um, you learn pretty quickly, especially in the safety net hospital, that that does not work. Um, so I think that we've learned that we have to figure out how to mobilize ourselves and, and um, be much more humble. I will say that we are now in medical school, just thank you for that opportunity to say, we're now teaching students. We have first year students who just started in August. They've all learned what an A3 is already. They're learning anatomy and they're learning the anatomy of an A3. Now that's just the A3 part of it. Now they're going to go start figuring out how, what happens when they write an A3 in a room on their own and then they bring it to people who actually own the work. And what's fascinating, you trust the process, is that I ask people, what did you learn at the end of a year? And they're like, I realized, I mean, I couldn't write these quotes any better, but I've written them down since they said it. I realized that my ideas didn't mean anything. It's really about what the people who own the work can make work. And if you learn that in the first year of medical school, it took me 10 years to figure that out. I hope that helps. Hi, uh, Joe Murley. I have a question. Um, first of all, I want to echo all the positive statements that you've said, uh, that you've heard, rather. Uh, I can't say anything more than what's already been said other than phenomenal job. And in my mind, what makes it phenomenal is you've captured the true essence of continuous improvement. You've captured the head, the heart, and the hands of the people involved. From a technical perspective, this idea of continuous improvement requires a standard and standard work so that we can challenge the standard work to see whether or not we're achieving the standard. So that's the engineering of it, if you will. What are we doing in your organization to move this thinking to the physicians, to the people that are actually providing the, 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 the medical health care aspect of what they're doing? Basically, if I was to use the Toyota example, those people assembling the cars 
are the focus of all continuous improvement in Toyota. And I'm finding that a lot of the healthcare applications that we talk about, we talk about the support organizations and we sort of work around the physician uh, because they're, they could be independent minded, believe it or not. Um, so I, could you speak a bit about how you've taken these lessons to the doctors? <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Well, <laughs> try to figure out where to start. I bet he has ideas too. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I think that the, we, we, the, we make the physician something special. And I just, to, to offer to you, I think we create villains unnecessarily. Um, and maybe it's because I'm in a safety net hospital where I have a different bias on this and we're so deeply mission driven. Um, that, that sense of purpose is, runs throughout our organization. And so, in some ways, I'd say start there. Um, I will say, you know, I just invited, so we, uh, and, this, and we, have a lot of, we have a lot of work to do on this. Um, I have the privilege of having a CEO who's a physician, just actually started in finance. Um, and she's a lead, leader, she's writing articles with John Toussaint. She's my CEO, so I'm pretty lucky. Um, I have two or three other physician leaders on our executive team who support this work um, and practicing this work and are making mistakes every single day. Um, so that's, that's been really helpful. I just we have trying, we're trying to figure out what it looks like. We have a great onboarding process for leaders who are DPH. And I'm really <laughs> trying to figure out how we do this for our UTSFs because I had a chief of surgery who showed up, got some, an org chart um, and some meetings to go to. A brand new chief of surgery and that was her orientation. Um, so we met with her, we talked about what lean leadership was. I've invited her just yesterday to the A3 thinking class that I teach. Um, and so I think that's a step. And so we're trying to figure out what that looks like. All of our department chiefs have gone through A3 thinking. They've all gone to our leadership version of what the daily management system is, even though none of them actually have, except for one, have a daily management system within the department. They have them within their areas, so the OR, et cetera. But Urology is the only, urology and anesthesia is the only group that have done their own huddles and are practicing this within their own departments. And then we um, require that all the performance improvement work reported by every single department is using A3 status reports. Um, so just to give you a sense of some of like the very concrete, how the tangible is fitting, and we teach the A3 thing not as an A3, right? It's, it's really the principles behind it. I hope that helps a little bit. We're trying to figure this out. Um, there's a lot of work to do, for sure. Okay. Well, would you please help me thank Will and Ray for being here? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.